Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have two very interesting guest lectures from two speakers, one from the west coast of the United States and the other one from the east coast of the United States. So we have covered both coasts. So first of all, let me introduce uh, Professor Deepthi Jayasekara, uh, who is a consultant infectious diseases specialist in the United States, uh, in, in Los Angeles, USA. He graduated from the Colombo Medical Faculty with honors in uh, 1991, and then moved to the United States, where he did his uh, residencies in internal medicine and infectious diseases. And uh, he is now a consultant in uh, Los Angeles. Um, he, together with his team, has been involved in managing uh, a very large number of COVID cases. And today, he will be talking about the United States experience of COVID-19 and the future, with special emphasis on long COVID. Over to you, Deepthi. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity to, to talk to you. Uh, about something that I'm very familiar with, something that I've been too familiar with, uh, given the, uh, the experience that we had uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of patients in the, in, in, uh, the United States and, in, uh, of course, uh, in Los Angeles area, Southern California. Uh, so I've been in practice as an infectious disease specialist and a consultant a clinical professor for about uh, what, like 25 years or yeah, close to 25 years. Uh, so I, when I started practicing uh, infectious diseases, I really started enjoying the, the subspeciality because uh, obviously uh, the headaches were much less with, uh, with a feel like infectious diseases. I had a cushy life uh, and uh, with cushy hours and then came the pandemic <laughs> and that kind of changed the whole thing for the past three years or so. Uh, it was anything but a cushy life. Um, uh, and it was like really, really bad uh, as far as uh, the working hours, uh, the commitment and the responsibilities concerned. Uh, there were times that we saw uh, uh, like 150 to 200 patients, uh, not in, the, in the, uh, the office, not in the clinics, but in the hospitals, and some of them were basically dropping dead left, right, and center. There were code blues, we call them code blues, the cardiac arrest, cardiopulmonary arrest, all over the hospital on every single day. That was so, so code blues are run by the, mainly the pulmonary team, the intensivist team, and we were running thin with the intensivists and the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary knowledge because obviously, there's so much they can handle, right? Uh, so when patients became very uh, distressed, breathless with uh, COVID-19 virus, especially with the, the second wave of COVID-19, uh, something that we call Epsilon variant, uh, that came right before the Delta variant. That was rampant, in, especially in the West Coast, California, and some of the, uh, uh, the East Coast and Midwest as well, especially in Los Angeles area. We had a lot of deaths at that time. Second wave, December of 2020, yeah, 2020. Uh, so that time, uh, it was, the, most of the places were haunted. Uh, only uh, uh, blessing uh, in disguise was that I, I got to the hospital within 10 minutes because there was no traffic at all, like on the street, typically it takes you know, half an hour also to drive to the hospital. But, but the, 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 the amount of, uh, the magnitude of the problem at the time was like unbelievable. And we had never worked so hard in our lives, right? So I obviously being a clinical professor and, and a teacher, as well as a clinician, I, I work with my team. But still, uh, sometimes with the junior staff, you, can't, you cannot uh, trust them to do certain stuff to, uh, to uh, to uh, save lives because it's some, most of the time it is a matter of uh, uh, minutes, seconds, or minutes that you make a crucial decision. So for 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 and for that to happen, you had to be there. So those were the hours. Sometimes we used to wake up at 4 a.m. 
uh, 3 a.m. and then finish off by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, the work is not still not done, right? I'm talking about ICU rounds, like my, my entire hospital of, uh, I, I work in two hospitals, so one is a teaching hospital, the other one is not. Uh, so uh, 400 beds, uh, 700 beds, and then uh, uh, and then uh, 100 bed hospital. That mo uh, b uh, both those hospitals, most of the flows were taken by the uh, critically ill ICU pa and HDU patients of COVID-19. So now I'm happy to announce, as a infectious disease specialist, that this is the uh, end of the pandemic. Now, when I say end of the pandemic, uh, right? So what did I do now? Yeah, there you go. Um, can I move on? Do you have a clicker? Or? Moving on. To, okay. All right. So objectives, uh, I don't think this is very applicable to you, but, but, but my uh, main objective was to, to, to discuss a little bit about long COVID um, and then uh, and the uh, and, um, anti antiviral medications. Um, again, the, uh, so if I say that this is the end of the pandemic, I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of you, uh, uh, most of you would agree, right? Uh, but this by n no means uh, is the end of the uh, infection of COVID-19, right? Because there's always going to be some COVID-19 infection. So going forward, yes, definitely we have to do our stuff, go around, uh, travel, enjoy life and all that and all that, but be mindful about uh, you yourself if you are immunocompromised or if you have a chronic medical problems, a problem um, or uh, if you're at high risk by, uh, with, uh, uh, for any diseases, especially if you, if you are immunocompromised or if you have a chronic disease like chronic kidney disease, CHF, CHF then um, even the, the, the least virulent form of COVID-19, which is Omicron now, least virulent but most contagious, right? Even the least virulent form of uh, uh, COVID-19, which is uh, Omicron BA4-5, can be uh, deadly to that person, right? In fact, even last week, just before I left, we had some deaths and some other, uh, you know, some, I, re I remember one patient, 79-year-old person uh, with uh, multiple lymphoma, um, in spite of all the vaccines and the boosters got COVID-19, unfortunately ended up in the ICU. See, so going forward, we had to remember vaccines and boosters, they don't prevent infections per se, but they do prevent ICU hospitalizations, ICU admissions and deaths, right? Uh, so that's very important to remember. Uh, so for those who are immunocompromised or who have chronic medical problems, elderly patients and stuff, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, it's very important to be vaccinated and boosted going forward. Now, having said this, I have to tell you that just last week, I, I think the FDA in the United States approved the second bivalent, uh, 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 bivalent vaccine. Second one. The first one was given, um, well, uh, uh, you know, it was released uh, end of last year, 2022. This is 2023. So the, the second one, was approved, so that means that we are very serious about giving the, the vaccines, COVID-19 vaccine boosters, especially the bivalent boosters every year. That's what it is, right? And then came a very controversial uh, subject uh, um, of if you had had an infection, how much of in, uh, uh, immunity uh, is there? How long will it last? And a lot of us thought, we were very confident um, and this, is the, this became very controversial, right? If you are vaccinated and boosted, you still can get an infection, right? And that's, that's okay. And those are my 99.99% mild infections uh, in, a, in a normal immunocompetent patient. Uh, but if you have had an infection, uh, whether you are boosted or not, whether you are vaccinated or not, uh, the latest Lancet article proved that you have about 10 months of immunity going forward. So that's a critical uh, point, right? So those are the points that they, they, the scientists failed to recognize. This is why it became very controversial, right? 
those who are vaccinated or boosted, yeah, they do have protection. They do have immunity. But those who have had the real infection, documented real infection, but a lot of them don't, don't even check nowadays, then that immunity would last for 10 months, which is great. great. Why? Because there are two types of immunity we are talking about, B cell immunity and T cell immunity. B cell immunity, more than B cell, the T cell immunity lasts longer. We always knew that. Uh, so this particular article uh, based on uh, for the randomized clinical trial confirmed that. So that's good. Uh, so should we travel? Yeah, absolutely, you should travel. I did, and these are some of those photographs actually uh, that uh, I found online. And, uh, but do we have to be careful? Yeah, absolutely. So say for instance, it's all, uh, it all depends on your situation, if you are, you, your immunity level, if you are your age, right? If you are in a very enclosed space with multiple unknown people, yeah, at that point you have to be careful. Then you wear a mask when you travel or when you get exposed anywhere. These are two places that I went to recently, to Iguazu Falls, Argentina, and uh, uh, Christ the Redeemer in Brazil. So I, I enjoy my traveling. These are not travel experience. This is actually my backyard. Uh, obviously, we, as you know, Los Angeles and Southern California especially, is going through a major, major, uh, like, uh, uh, severe run of uh, rain, cold weather and stuff. So most of the mountains are filled with uh, uh, <laughs> snow now. This is California, believe it or not. We never, I've never seen this much of snow, uh, and this is April. So it's that bad. This is what you call the other side of global warming. So it's a, it, that, again, is a controversial subject. Again, now uh, I'm going to actually dive into the controversies of uh, COVID-19. And that's, some, uh, that's a, a major uh, issue when it comes to the Western world, right? Um, so this is the virus. This is a mesmerizing picture of a very rootless virus. But the one that I wanted to point out is, are the, the spike protein. The, 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 the key proteins are the spike protein, M protein, envelope proteins, and the uh, nuclear capsid. Uh, these are the antigens that we take advantage of as scientists to produce vaccines. So the controversies with COVID-19 are, uh, you know, listed here. The origin of COVID-19 is still a controversy, right? How was this virus created? Or when was it created? And was it accidental or was it uh, purposeful, right? So a latest uh, intelligence reports have shown that it is an accidental release from Wuhan. Now, would China believe that? Would we believe it? Well, that's... That's a controversy, right? So obviously, we in the Western countries, we in America, we believe that this was an accidental uh, release of a, a, a rootless virus. Uh, but the origin, the origin of that rootless virus, may have been a uh, due to a, uh, a you know a normal zoonotic viral origin. Same thing, right? Zoonotic viruses uh, are originated by uh, people, but originally they come from animals, right? So this what this is what happens when you eat those animals, consume those uh, those animals without cooking. That's the result. So which animal we still don't know. Obviously, that's 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 one of those controversies. Quarantine, uh, masks, vaccines, ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine uh, as treatment, and public health mandates. Those were all controversial subjects. So uh, now moving on to, uh, again, conspiracy theories. So cons conspiracy theories are also incorporated into the controversies now. Uh, so uh, I can give you one conspiracy theory. Now they, they said the virus was deliberately created by the Chinese in their own lab. Now, Americans, some Americans do believe that Dr. Fauci misspelled F-A-U-C-I. Dr. Fauci had, a, uh, had some hand in that, right? So again, these are big topics that uh, we have no control, we have no knowledge of, right? So he, I believe that as an infectious disease specialist, as a member, life member of uh, Infectious Disease Society of America, I believe Dr. Fauci great, did a great job. Uh, he and his team with NIH, and NI, uh, National Institute of uh, Infectious Diseases and uh, Allergies, they did a wonderful job coming out, they came out with that very first vaccine uh, when President Trump almost threatened him 
to come up with a, a vaccine within six months, right? Is that, I probably, I, I'm pretty sure you, you know this. President Trump, almost like in, in a small room um, at uh, the uh, Atlanta uh, CDC headquarters, uh, got he, he talked to the uh, the CEO of Moderna, and then Dr. Fauci, who's the director of NIH, uh, he kind of threatened them to you have to come up with a vaccine within a matter of uh, one year, he said. And actually, the team came up with a vaccine within a matter of six months. That's what, that was great. Uh, that's, a real, that's a reality that we know of. But then again, you talk to an average American, there's always this questionable Dr. Fauci's ill roles with, with the virus. So that, you know, be it as it may. Uh, then, then most recently, U.S. House, House of Representatives voted 490 to zero to declassify intelligence because we still don't know what the truth behind the, uh, the origin of the virus. So they were forced to declassify some of the intelligence reports. So all these things are going on. But you know, to call um, COVID-19 a bacteria is kind of almost borderline stupid, right? Now that itself is a con conspiracy. Some people, they, they still call this a bacteria because bacteria causes severe uh, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Uh, we know this with sepsis situations, so they call COVID-19 uh, bacteria. Again, am I gonna change their mindsets about these things? I'm not gonna waste my time anymore. And then smoking decreases the risk of uh, getting COVID-19 and stuff. Th th those are, you know, absolutely stupid controversies, yeah. Uh, there were a lot of issues with um, forced rearrangement of working conditions like remote work and stuff. At the time, there were mandates, so that itself was a controversy to begin with. But some people like it. Some people like the fact that they, ha they can work from home. So in fact, those places who lost a lot of workers to, to, to this situation, and they, uh, they had to shut down their businesses. So unfortunately, those things happen. The old wounds reopened with ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. So now ivermectin, I'm pretty sure you know about ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. 2020, uh, I was here actually 2019 in December and then we left 2020 uh, January after a few weeks of vacation. Uh, right after that came COVID-19 in, in, in some countries. But 2020, I think uh, uh, March or April, WHO declared this as a uh, uh, I think um, a pandemic or pre-pandemic situation. So the first few months, we didn't know what to give these patients, right? Patients are getting hospitalized. Patients are sick. Patients are having difficulty in breathing. What do we use? We can, I mean, obviously you can't let them die. So, and then luckily June of 2020, one of the recovery trials in, uh, coming from uh, uh, England, UK, Oxford based, uh, confirmed that, based on their uh, randomized clinical trial data, that steroids, uh, dexamethasone, saves lives. So they have mortality benefit. So right away we started using, we did use steroids before, but right away from June onwards we started using dexamethasone. But uh, for the virus to create this kind of a mayhem, you know, uh, and, and to get to that level that we had to use uh, steroids, so we had to do something to prevent that. Because when you actually do a, a diagnose of viral infections, uh, you do the rapid antigen first, right? So that's, but the gold standard is the PCR. So rapid antigen is good enough for us to diagnose m many, many uh, viral infections, including COVID-19 now. Uh, but so once you diagnose that, we have to, we had to do certain things to mitigate that situation so that it won't uh, blow into uh, blow out of pro proportion, right? So we, that that was the time that we started using hydroxychloroquine and uh, ivermectin. So I firmly believed at that time uh, there were some benefits of, of ivermectin as well as hydroxychloroquine. But there was a lot of pushback b uh, based on, uh, you know, politics. COVID-19 has become a, a, a highly controversial, politicized topic. No question about it. So we in the United States had, uh, as physicians, especially as infectious disease specialists and pulmonologists, had a lot of problems, including death threats against us. If we decide to give hydroxychloroquine, or if I decided not to give hydroxychloroquine, if you decide to give remdesivir, or if you decide not to give remdesivir, right? 
So, so that kind of situations arose. Of course, yeah, uh, nothing happened. I'm still alive, uh, and most of the doctors are alive. But, but that, the magnitude of this problem was very, very... Uh, so what you see from these, uh, uh, based on the, clinical the uh, randomized clinical trials is one side. Then the other side is uh, these the ordinary people who are trying to question all these things and try to, try to uh, target the physicians right, who are treating their loved ones, their mothers, their fathers, and so on, uh, and, and threatening them, right, uh, with the death threats and stuff. Uh, so that's, not, that's no fun. So we did work hard, but working hard at that time in the middle of all these death threats and stuff, is, it, that was not, not fun at all. Uh, but again, I'm, now I'm laughing because obviously we all survived. So, so uh, the story of ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine is that, and later on, when we had the antivirals, especially the remdesivir intravenous for very sick patients, we gave up some of these medications, right? And then came the subject of uh, uh, oral antivirals to prevent hospitalization. Now we have two excellent, uh, uh, somewhat excellent, uh, right, antivirals, which are, uh, you know, mostly uh, protease inhibitors and polymerase inhibitors. So the names of those medications are Paxlovid. It's a combination of nimetrovir and uh, 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 another very well-known uh, booster to that, uh, ritonavir, and then the second one is molnupiravir. So, uh, for instance, ivermectin was great even in renally compromised patients. If the patient is hospitalized with kidney disease and COVID-19, you cannot, obviously we cannot give remdesivir, right? You can um, basically kill that patient by giving remdesivir. So, what did I use? Ivermectin at that time. High doses of ivermectin for five days, 12 milligrams twice a day for five days. I still remember the doses. So that kind of situ scenarios. And then came the letters from the hospital administration. Okay, so why are you using ivermectin? Then, then we forward our side of the story. And they are fine. That's fine. We, we survived. The, the patient survived, we survived too, right? That such was the, the magnitude of these controversies of uh, COVID-19. Uh, me uh, medications of COVID-19. And, and again, this mistrust of government policies, lockdowns, and vaccine mandates, and uh, all those things are still going on and on and on. Thankfully, we don't have any mandates, uh, lockdown mandates anymore. But certain countries like uh, China, there are mandates. There are, I mean, obviously there are, that's how they do uh, business, right, with their patients or whatever they do. So, and, and, and there are some ongoing issues with uh, COVID-19, although we think that this is the end of the pandemic. That's, that's what I want to uh, emphasize at this point. Uh, just to give you a little perspective of uh, how many variants we've had so far, many, many variants, but the main ones were alpha, beta, gamma, and then came the delta. Delta was the, if, I, if you ask me what was the deadliest uh, 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 variant, it was delta, right? And then came few months later, uh, last year actually, uh, 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 I would say, uh, no, 2021, towards the end of 21 and then beginning of 2022 came the Omicron variant. And that, by the time Omicron came about, we knew that COVID was, the virus was losing its virulence, losing uh, the fire power of the virus, right? But the virus was getting smarter. They started mutating into these forms which were more contagious. So there were lots and lots of people who get, got these infections. Thankfully, when I got the, my, my uh, COVID-19 just a few months ago, it was just an upper respiratory infection, right? There was, there was uh, I mean, I had a little headache and congestion, which lasted for about four or five days, uh, went away. So that's the story of uh, COVID-19 in most of normally not immuno, non-immunocompromised patients or immunocompetent pa people. Right? So we have come to that. So Omicron variant that came about uh, as a result of uh, the, the, uh, the findings in Botswana in, in uh, uh, November of 2021 kind of raged through the world uh, and creating a lot of problems. But even before that, you know that we have had about 15 uh, million deaths, 14 to 15, uh, I'm sorry, 10 to 15 million deaths so far with COVID-19. Now. Are they all confirmed? Are they all documented? No, because there are some areas of the world where they don't even report this, especially China. They never reported the, the true numbers, right? In Africa, that's another, because of the, the, uh, the, the poor uh, system, uh, healthcare systems, right? Unfortunately, so reporting system is not great. So I believe that, that COVID killed about f uh, 10 to 15 
million people so far. And this, uh, that itself is a controversy when you talk about it, because some people might say, okay, that was not COVID. It was, these patients were killed by the bacterial infection. Remember 1918, we had 40, uh, 50 million deaths, 50 to 100 million deaths, right? So, but nobody is gonna, we, our science was not powerful enough to say, okay, was it the virus that killed those patients, all of those patients versus or bacterial, and we know that the post-viral pneumonia uh, as are caused by streptococcal pneumonia, or pneumococcal bacteria, or Staph aureus. Those are the two uh, bacteria. So I firmly believe that most of those deaths were caused by the bacterial or post-viral bacterial pneumonia. But and then at that time, there were no antibiotics. So the fact that the, we used antibiotics up front in so certain patients of COVID-19 itself was a controversy, right? I, out of fear of losing that patient with a secondary bacterial infection, some of us started antibiotics like um, uh, macrolide antibodies such as uh, azithromycin or, or you know, even uh, clarithromycin uh, up front. Because I know that uh, with our experience, we know that azithromycin and clarithromycin are not just antibody but also anti-inflammatory agents, right? So again, that kind of controversy will continue, right? Again, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place now. So, so going back to COVID-19, um, Omicron variant, so first found in Botswana, and it was originally named the B11529, and there were so many subvariants of that on the same lineage, BA1, BA2, BA3, BA4, and 5. So what's happening right now is BA, uh, I'm pretty sure you know, like uh, BA4 and 5 were the, 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 the least virulent but most contagious ones, right? But then there was an offshoot of uh, the same lineage from BA2 called uh, XB, XBB1 and 1.5. Now that's been rampant in the United States right now. Again, highly contagious, less severe, le less virulent. Short incubation periods for three days, mostly upper respiratory infection. Personally, what I experienced uh, when I got COVID-19 after three years uh, was a severe headache and, and uh, congested uh, you know, upper respiratory area. So uh, I'm not going to go into details. Typically, when you, when, when you get a viral infection, uh, well, a pandemic uh, with a viral infection, this is the way it goes about. And same thing happened to uh, Omicron variant. Uh, this is because of the ability of the, those mutations to spread faster in humans uh, as we go on, because it's all about the tussle between human power versus viral power, right? The ability to evade the detection by specific diagnostic tests, decreased susceptibility to uh, monoclonal antibodies, that's in modern days, ability to evade vaccine-induced immunity, and uh, so on. So, uh, Omicron variant, I'm pretty sure you, you know these things, uh, Omicron variant, which came about last year, and, and showed immune escape and reinfection, much higher rates of immune escape and reinfection. The doubling time was, was uh, less than 2.5, doubles very quickly. Uh, reinfection rates 25% for Omicron versus 9% for Delta. And uh, so, so when you talk about viruses, the most contagious virus on Earth is measles virus, right? Uh, the, uh, the R naught of measles virus is one, two. 16. So we, some of us believe that uh, the, these contagious, most contagious COVID-19 uh, subvariants like BA4, 5 are as, as contagious as, uh, as measles virus, right? So it is less virulent, less deadly from studies on, from many, many countries. This, this is an old slide. Uh, 70 times more infectious in upper airways. This was scientifically proven by uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Malik Piris and colleagues at uh, University of Hong Kong. Again, this is what's happening right now. 97% of the cases in the, in the uh, basically 97% of COVID cases uh, belong to BA5 and BA7 lineages in China. And then rest of the world, we have a lot of XBB1 and XBB1.5. What is XBB1 and 1.5? Those are sub-sub-variants of BA2. We are two of Omicron variant. I mean, for a, if you're not following these uh, uh, the numbers, it's very hard for you to, to understand and, and remember these things. But as infectious disease doctors, we 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 had to follow these things, right? Because would I do anything different from uh, uh, with B XBB 1.5 versus uh, original Wuhan? Well, there are certain things that we consider. So again, um, uh, right now, what is what is spreading, what is rampant in the Western countries is XBB 1.5. But people are not paying much attention to it because, you know, obviously most of these infections are 
uh, mild upper respiratory infections. But make sure that your loved ones, your elderly parents, your elderly grandparents, those are immunocompromised, right? And your, your immunocompromised patients that you're, you're living with, uh, your patient, the, 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 the people with chronic kidney disease, CHF, that you're living with, now those will behave very differently with those mild infections. So please be mindful of those things going forward. Um, I'm gonna skip some of these things. This is how we detect or diagnose COVID-19. Uh, there are two main tests, which are rapid antigen and PCR. What's the gold standard? What's the gold standard for a bacterial infection or fungal infection? Uh, mycobacterial infection is still the culture, right? But the world has evolved, especially in the Western world, we, we evolved into other techniques, such as molecular techniques. Our PCR method has been very widely used for, for most of the bacterial and fungal and uh, other infections. Now we can r rapidly diagnose those bacteria, those genetically mutated bacteria with multidrug resistant, even uh, XDR tuberculosis, using very quickly, using the rapid diagnostic tests. So, Going back to COVID-19, we diagnose that with rapid antigen. Now, does that differentiate between a Delta versus Omicron? No, it doesn't. Only way to tell you uh, uh, that this could be an Omicron variant is with this concept called S-drop, because there are three genes that we target when you do a PCR. Those three genes are given right there, which is spike, nuclear capsid, N2, and then envelope. So when it comes to Omicron, there's a S gene undetection called S gene drop. So that's an indication that I, I, you don't have to worry about it because most of the cases are, 99.99 cases are uh, Omicron. And the sublineage, uh, the, uh, the uh, Omicron lineage subvariants are the BF1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, so I don't want to waste too much time on uh, these things. Uh, uh, this is kind of common knowledge now, um, the, uh, the specifics about the tests involved. And in my hospitals and most of the hospitals in the United States, we do use uh, rapid antigen for the diagnosis. Because rapid antigen actually tells you uh, that the patient's infectious, right? So it's not just a matter of diagnosing, but I want to make sure that that patient is not infectious by the time we released, uh, release him from isolation. So I, I have a lot of fights with hospital administration, even today, right? If I don't have access to rapid antigen, because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of us have like moved on to PCR platform. PCR is great. PCR is the gold standard of diagnosis of COVID-19. But I, I don't care about PCR. What I care about is the rapid antigen. Why? Because I want to make sure that the patient is infectious or non-infectious to take him out of the isolation, right? That matters. Because if you, if you have, a, in the next room, if you have an immunocompromised patient and I take him off isolation thinking that he's non-infectious, that's a problem. So that's why we always have the, our fights with hospital administration, uh, hospital administration of different hospitals. But good hospitals, the university hospitals, the academic centers, they always allow us to do both uh, rapid antigens as well as PCR. Again, PCR, this is the, uh, the, most of the newer PCRs, the, uh, the, the specificity and sensitivity are very good. And, and, and the rapid antigen also evolved into a very good test now, right? Uh, so there are multiple, multiple platforms of rapid antigens and, and uh, PCRs. So that's about testing. Now, what about these common questions on COVID-19? Can the tests determine which COVID-19 variants I have? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Of course, I explained that before. Uh, by, by using the, uh, the expression called S protein drop. Now, prevention of COVID-19 hospitalizations, not the infections per se, but the, the severe infections, are categorized this way. This is M, three M's, I always call it, or four M's. M for mass, M for mRNA and other vaccines, M for monoclonal antibodies, antibody cocktails it used to be, but now it's single antibodies, and then M for uh, PrEP. For PrEP means pre-exposure prophylaxis, certain immunocompromised patients we use, monoclonal antibody called uh, Evushel, right? Now, the monoclonal concept came about with Ebola, right? Even before that, I think we had some monoclonal antibodies, but with Ebola, when patients were dropping dead with, with, with very high case fatality rate in, in Africa, uh, we were helpless because the vaccines were not effective. So what we did was, some of these companies actually raised to, to, to uh, manufacture monoclonal antibodies. The, the best one uh, that came about thanks to that raise was a monoclonal called uh, ZMAP from nicotine plant, right? 
But nowadays, monoclonal antibodies are, uh, are used using the labs, right? Regular labs, is the culture-based labs. So because of that, monoclonal antibodies have become a very effective way of, of, of uh, uh, containing a pandemic. Going forward, remember, in the unlikely scenario, if there's another pandemic five or 10 years down the line, I, know, I, don't, I don't think you want me to say that, uh, but it is what it is, right? If in the unlikely scenario, there's another pandemic, these are the things that will save your lives. So I think all of y'all better remember this going forward, right? M for mass, M for mRNA other vaccines, M for monoclonal antibodies, and then M for monoclonal for PrEP. That's a different thing, right? Uh, right now, sadly, the uh, BA4 and 5 as well as BA2 subvariants are not contained by monoclonal antibodies. So because of that, FDA uh, discontinued the use of, uh, uh, basically withdrew uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the only monoclonal antibody that we had against Omicron variant called Bebtelivimab. So that's a different scenario. So, so now we know that monoclonal antibodies don't prevent the, the, the latest variants. That's, that's what it says. But, but when I went to uh, Washington, D.C. for the uh, infectious disease IDSA conference, they really promoted the, uh, the bebtelibumab for, for prevention of severe disease when you have COVID-19, and also to prevent COVID-19 if you are not able to take a vaccine then especially the immunocompromised ones, then you go with AstraZeneca's uh, Evushel. Now, now, that's not AstraZeneca vaccine. We are talking about the AstraZeneca monoclonal antibody called Evushel. In my office, in my practice, we, give, we used to give thousands of Evushel to prevent severe COVID-19 on those elderly patients, immunocompromised patients, such as you know, transplant and, uh, and uh, that type of infection. So, now, I like this. The first symptom of COVID is denial. These are old, old uh, uh, anecdotes. Uh, long COVID, what exactly is long COVID? So long COVID is a constellation of symptoms, uh, uh, presentations such as, okay, I got COVID-19 within the last two to three months. Now I, my brain is not functioning well. I, can, I still cannot smell. I still cannot uh, taste. I'm very fatigued. My heart rate's very high. I, it wasn't the case. I'm a good athlete, right? My heart rate is running around 50 to 60 on a regular basis. But now, after I got this COVID-19, uh, severe COVID-19, my heart rate has been 120, 130. That kind of scenario. So, so basically, it's, it's a combination of, uh, a constellation of presentations that we put together uh, called post-acute post-acute sequelae of COVID. Cognitive symptoms, uh, chronic cough, ongoing cough. They cough so much, like, uh, but thankfully, a lot of them, I would say, uh, uh, 90 some, but I would say more than half, 90% uh, of them resolve within a matter of three to six months. But it's a problem because, why is it a problem? Because most of these new subvariants are so contagious that it's affecting you, 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 and me, right? So it, you, I might be positive. Now, I, actually, I know that I was positive in December. Uh, so all you guys are at risk to develop long COVID. Now, that long COVID can take a big toll on you. Why? Because we know that about 10%, it's only about 10% of the case that it becomes a real problem. But at the same time, you know that it, the real number is much more than that. So if you have cognitive issues, if you have mental fog or brain fog, chronic cough, POTS syndrome, POTS syndrome is basically dysautonomia. Uh, when you, you know, postural, that POTS is basically postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, right? If you have fatigue, chronic fatigue, sleep disturbances, you cannot function. So now, yeah, it's, it's affecting not just your life, but also the livelihoods, right? So it has become another problem now. I get tons of patients, so many calls from patients who, are, who have good insurance that we turn down. Why? Be, I cannot handle so many patients, or my group, we cannot handle so many patients of post-COVID, uh, long COVID syndromes. It, that, it's that bad now. So how do you solve this problem? We don't know, because simply because we still don't know the mechanism behind COVID, uh, long COVID syndrome. But we know, this is what we know about COVID, uh, long COVID. It happens mostly in about 10% of the cases, but I think the real number is much more than that. About 65 million around the world is suffering currently.
from, from uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID or long COVID. It typically lasts for about three to six months, but large study in Scotland showed more than half recover within uh, 18 months, but I think generally three to six months. And, and there, there are some good news that vaccines, uh, as well as antiviral uh, medications like Paxlovid, minimizes uh, the, uh, the chances of, uh, or the risk of uh, long COVID. That, that's good news, actually. Again, I put a question mark there because, again, somebody else might question that. Uh, high risk, somebody else who don't will, uh, believe in vaccines can question this too, right? Again, these are the controversies that we deal with as infectious diseases uh, year in, year, I'm sorry, day in, day out in the United States. High risk, some of these patients are very high risk for, for dying. And we, we recently had, I think, one of the professor's son died of, uh, of a post-acute sequelae of or long COVID, right? Sadly, uh, we believe that it was an acute uh, coronary event. So how, acute coronary events such as you know, uh, you know, arrhythmias or, or myocardial infarction, strokes, and uh, pulmonary embolism in that part of the world, cardiac arrest, type two diabetes, sudden death syndrome, these are all linked to long COVID syndrome. So this is, so I think we as physicians need to, physicians need to uh, pay attention to long COVID going forward, right? So uh, how do you diagnose this? We don't know how to diagnose, so in order to diagnose long COVID, we need to be aware of what is long COVID. So definitions is very important. And are there any specific tests to diagnose long COVID? No, we don't. We don't have any. We know the fact that if you do a rapid antigen or PCR for COVID-19 in those long COVID patients, they are negative. That's all we know. But there were some patients who come to, came to me and said, okay, doctor, I have this little uh, chronic fatigue, severe sore throat going on for months now after I got severe COVID. So I do multiple tests, test after test of rapid antigen PCR, they're all negative. But it's important to know that some of the immune markers are elevated. Like, like if you do IL-6 level, that'll be elevated. And certain, like TNF levels will be elevated. Um, I would say uh, there's reactivation of uh, other viruses such as herpes viruses, right? HSV1, HSV2, EB virus, like monoclonal uh, mononucleosis causing uh, the virus, which is Epstein Barr virus. Those markers are high. So now you may wonder, oh, did you get COVID-19 as well as monoclonal uh, mononucleosis? Not not monoclonal, mononucleosis at the same time? In fact, there was a young girl who came to me, a, a college kid, um, like university student came to me, and, and her uh, EB viral panel was way high off the chart. And then she just recovered for COVID. So I, I had to tell her, honestly, I don't know whether you had two infections side by side at the same time, right? But now we, with, with the knowledge that we have with clinical trial, with, with all those uh, trials going on, we know that they are just uh, like kind of immune markers of, of uh, COVID, um, you know, of long COVID syndrome. Again, the mechanisms are not very well understood, but we know certain markers, uh, immune markers are elevated, like cytokines, TNF, IL-1B, IL-6, and IP-10. Studies looking at the immune dysregulation uh, uh, with with low CD4 and CD8 counts and, and then exhausted uh, T cells and T cell alteration. All those are, I think, mostly theories. Then, and then, uh, but, but at the end of the day, we know how to manage those things because it's all symptomatic management, right? If you have a chronic cough, then you, I, I give a short course of steroids, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a medrol pack for it. That's a five-day course of uh, dexamethasone that we give, tapering dose. That works beautifully. Um, and then sometimes we give you a steroid inhaler. If you have POT syndrome, like postural orthostatic tachycardia, you, if your heart rate is 120, 130, 140, uh, that you didn't have before, then we, give a, we put them on a short course of uh, beta blockers, right? So, and that works. Low dose uh, naltrexone has worked in certain, certain situations. Intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG, very expensive treatment, has worked in certain patients. Like somebody who comes with severe sore throat every single day after COVID, I have to give at least one to two doses of immunoglobulin. Now, in the Western world, you can do that. But here, I don't know. There are lots of non-pharmacological pharmacological options that we use, such as increasing salt intake for POTS, uh, that's uh, uh, you know, dis uh, 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 postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, uh, cognitive pacing for cognitive dysfunction, elimination diets for gastrointestinal symptoms, and so on and so forth. It has become a very, very multidisciplinary, controversial, uh, somewhat controversial area. So going back to the vaccines, again, 
We know that there are many, many vaccines, but what we need to know is who should be vaccinated, who should, not be, who should be boosted, and who should not be boosted, right? Now, I think, uh, as far as the uh, United States is concerned, we know that there, are some, uh, there, were, there was a big study done that showed some 90-some percent uh, uh, evidence that they have had the infection or the vaccine. So that's pretty good. That's what you call herd immunity. You have heard about herd immunity, right? So herd immunity is very doable, even with COVID-19. Now, here's the problem. But when it comes to uh, immunocompromised patients, elderly patients, you can't just trust that. You have to give something else. So that's why the, the concept of boosters came about. So now we know that those are the categories to focus on. How well the, the, these boosters are accepted among uh, uh, ordinary people in the United States? Well, that's always a question, right? Obviously, they are fighting this thing now. They are saying, no, we don't want all this toxic material in, my, in our arms, right? We had it. I'm, I'm not going to be uh, boosted again, ever, right? So, so we just let them have it. That's okay. That's not my problem anymore. The science shows that boosters are working well, especially in those categories of people. I would say over 65, immunocompromised people, people with chronic diseases. Please make sure that you at least boost them with, with the new boosters. Now, what are the new boosters available? Uh, the, the, the most powerful two new boosters are mRNA vaccines, which are Pfizer and Moderna, the bivalent boosters, right? So as I told you before, bivalent one, bivalent boosters uh, are given to the, those people. Now, would I take bi a bivalent booster? Um, now, well, I took one. Uh, that was end of last year. Would I take another one this year? Probably not. Why? Because I had COVID in, in uh, December of 2022. So I believe, based on this new Lancet article, I believe that I have ongoing immunity for about 10 months, right? So that's all very individualized. So somebody might question, okay, so you believe in that. Can you say that to your patients? No, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, okay, the science has shown that if you have had COVID-19, at least a moderate to severe infection, you have lasting immunity up to 10 months. Now, if I give you a booster, that could be, that would be another layer of protection. So that's why we give boosters. Latest, boost, latest bo boosters are bivalent against both ancestral form as well as the, uh, the new Omicron forms. So it is what it is, right? So that, that's what it is, added layer of protection. If your level of immuni immunity is low, you need to have that added layer of protection, right? Based on those numbers, I'm not gonna go into those things. You can take a picture of this. Mostly uh, with mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. So now in the, in the United States uh, and other Western countries, everybody over six months are eligible for these vaccines, which is good. Like it, that's what we do to influenza, influenza flu, right? Flu and other respiratory viruses are a problem when it comes to uh, uh, temperate climate uh, in the, the Western countries because we have seasons. So when it comes to the late fall, uh, fall, fall is basically autumn, and then the winter, and then the spring, there are lots and lots of people who are coughing with upper respiratory. If, if you can prevent some of that with, with the flu vaccine, with, uh, with the bivalent vaccine, why don't I do that? Now there's RSV vaccine coming up, a respiratory sensitive virus. Uh, JNJ booster is, is no more. Uh, I, I don't recommend that because it's been very weak. Uh, so again, the fourth dose, fifth dose, so we talked about this. Latest Lancet article showed lasting immunity up to 10 months after an infection. All right, so I think I'm nearing my uh, to be or not to be. I don't know the answer to that. To be boosted or not to be boosted. It's very individualized. Uh, common questions on COVID-19, again. Um, so 95 people who had COVID, at least three out of five immune system components that could recognize COVID up to eight months after infection. That's what we were talking about, right? And um, so B cell immunity and T cell immunity uh, are equally important. I'm gonna skip some of these stripes. Now, actually, uh, I'm gonna move on to, that's a good one, right? Uh, <laughs> this early part of the pandemic. Mom, we had haircuts. I'm not mom, I'm your dad, <laughs> because the hair has grown so much. And this is a Corona ad, Corona, the beer bottle <laughs> with the lime. So who knows what goes great with coronavirus? Of course, it's a lime, lime disease, right? So switching to the best way to mitigate 
the future of the, uh, the pandemic, well, there's no pandemic, future variant, I would say, would be oral antiviral pills, intravenous remdesivir, which is a relatively weak antiviral, and there are some resistance as well now, but we, do, we give it outpatient now to prevent hospitalization, which is great. Now, in my office, in my clinic, I can pick and choose the patients who are positive for COVID-19 and give three-day course of remdesivir to prevent them getting hospitalized. So that, that, that option is out there now. Uh, it's, it's a CDC and FDA approved one. And then monoclonal antibodies are not working against new, new subvariants, so that's been kind of temporarily deleted. And then the other measures that we take for, for COVID-19 high-risk patients, steroid inhalers, per, you know, stoic and principal trials, Fluoxamine is antidepressant, SSRI, we use that. We st some people still use it to prevent, you know, escalating this problem. And then high dose vitamin C, vitamin D3, or vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc and colchicine. Those are some of the things. But I think the main uh, focus is on oral antivirals. Now, a majority of the patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19 are getting a prescription, five-day prescription of Paxlovid. Why? Because Paxlovid has shown uh, uh, to be mitigate, uh, uh, preventing hospitalization. So Paxlovid is a combination of two antivirals. One is uh, Numetrovir, the other one is Ritonavir. We as H HIV specialists, we have tons of experience with Ritonavir, why? Because it's a protease inhibitor. So they found out that another protease newly, di uh, newly uh, uh, you know, found uh, protease inhibitor called Numetrovir, when you use it in combination with Ritonavir, uh, you have a strong uh, COVID antiviral. That's the whole idea. But you have to give it for five days. You have to give it within the first five days of the, uh, of the diagnosis. In other words, if I started sniffing, uh, uh, the sniffles and, and then the congestion and the headaches uh, today, uh, day number two, day number three, I would probably wait. Okay, uh, all this will go away. I will just uh, you know, be in self-isolation for about five days. And then, if you want, you can retest yourself with a negative uh, rapid antigen, and then go to work by wearing a mask and another five days. But if I'm high risk or if my symptoms are escalating after day number two, day number three, within the first five days, then I will prescribe uh, that patient to that patient uh, a um, antiviral. And what is that antiviral? That's the Paxlovid antiviral. So that's three uh, capsules, if I remember right, three capsules twice a day for five days. And it's relatively well tolerated. But when Dr. Fauci got it, <laughs> uh, like many months ago, he had a rebound. And, and then that was so concerning, right? Because our top infectious disease guy started taking antiviral. And uh, about a week or two weeks later, he had a rebound of symptoms. So that was a concern. So why do they get so rebound test positivity and rebound symptoms is a problem with this particular antiviral, right? Well, that doesn't mean anything, but it just means that some patients can pretend about 10% of patients can have rebounded symptoms. So then they have to isolate themselves again for the next five days. And then would you use, uh, he himself used another course of uh, Paxlovid, which, which took care of the rebound. So that probably means that you are getting inadequate length of uh, the antiviral. Uh, but for the most part, um, Paxlovid, and the second one is called Molnopiravir by Merck. They have worked well for us. Molnopiravir is less, if, uh, less effective than Paxlovid. So now uh, about the Paxlovid, so we already went through this. Uh, HIV protease inhibitor is a Ritonavir. We use that as a pharmacokinetic booster to boost because it's a P450 inhibitor. Uh, so P450 inhibi inhibitors are used uh, as a, as a P, uh, pharmacokinetic boosters to boost the levels of other medications, such as the other protease inhibitors in HIV. So we use the same concept here uh, to, to, uh, with in, in combination with nimetrovir. 89% efficacy if taken within the first three days, 88% efficacy if taken within the four days. So those are the uh, EPIC trials. Safety considerations, very safe in general, but you have to be careful with the other medication that you are taking. If you're taking blood thinners, if you're taking statins, statins for, for cholesterol, if you're taking blood pressure medications. So, so, so basically you have to go through, you have to listen to the, uh, the pharmacists or your doctors who know about this thing before taking Paxlovid, uh, right? Certain medications are not allowed with uh, Paxlovid, which are rifampin seizure medication because they are 
P450 induces St. John's water and stuff. It is relatively contraindicated in renal failure, but there are dosing adjustments. Uh, this is one component of uh, Paxlovid called nimetrovir, and the second one is uh, the ritonavir. Now, this, the second antiviral pill is called molnopiravir. Molnopiravir, uh, it was uh, by Merck, and it's not as effective as Paxlovid. The numbers are slightly less. 30 to 50 percent reduction in severe diseases and hospitalizations. But the concern, safety, uh, the, the biggest advantage is that you can use this in even uh, kidney patients, your kidney and, and liver patients. So no renal or hepatic adjustments, and no drug drug interactions, no drug interactions, and can be taken with or without food. Uh, but the efficacy is lower, and it is a RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhib inhibitor. Um, outpatient remdesivir, I don't have much time to talk about remdesivir here, uh, but uh, remdesivir was introduced as an RNA-dependent RNA, RNA in, um, uh, polymerase inhibitor, which was used for Ebola, and then SARS, a COVID-1, and then I use here. And kind of uh, uh, relatively, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, it kind of disappoints us sometimes, right? You are, you are, you're using this, and you still have to worry about those side effects intravenous use, right? Side effects of renal impairment and hepatotoxicity. But, you know, for the most part, I've incorporated that into my protocol, COVID protocol. So when severe patients come into the hospital, we do use five days of intravenous remdesivir. But uh, as outpatient, we use three days of uh, remdesivir. So monitoring part is, is not that, uh, uh, you know, stringent at that time. So the three-day course, this is about three-day course uh, as an outpatient. So if you go through IDSA, um, what the roadmap uh, for, for prevention of hospitalization for COVID-19, this is there now. So antiviral oral pill and intravenous three-day course of remdesivir and then the monoclonal cocktails, but sadly the monoclonal cocktails are not working well against uh, the, uh, the, uh, the newest variants of COVID-19 such as BA4 and 5. So that was withdrawn from the, uh, the, the approval especially the Bepta lower by Lilly. But uh, overall, I think even President Trump took, uh, remember when he got COVID, he was the first uh, celebrity, so to speak, who took uh, uh, the monoclonal antibody. Uh, uh, he took, uh, I think, region COVID monoclonal antibody. And, and actually, he did well. He had a lot of, he had a lot of uh, risk factors for deterioration, and he didn't deteriorate. I think it is thanks to the, uh, the monoclonal antibody. So these are some of the Monoclonals, I don't think you need to know much about these monoclonals. These are for my students mostly, mainly, and the fellow uh, junior doctors. High veil, um, um, base, uh, the uh, high titer convalescent plasma w was used before, but we dropped that also because it's, it's very tedious and, and uh, the process is very time consuming. Uh, because we do have the antivirals now. We, we do have the oral antivirus, we do have the intravenous remdesivir, at, uh, so obviously with that background, we have dropped our, uh, uh, going forward, uh, uh, dropped our um, the convalescent plasma. Going forward, if there's another pandemic, in the unlikely scenario that there's another major pandemic, convalescent plasma is a good way to attack that right up front. Why? Because that's what we did with so many pandemics in the past. If you go through the literature, we use monoclonal antibody, I'm sorry, we use uh, 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 convalescent plasma to mitigate those uh, uh, pandemics right up front. These are the CDC recommendations for COVID hospitalized cases. Again, we've been through this. I put together uh, a protocol called uh, a DRAPE protocol or DRAPE formula, easy way to remember, D-R-A-P-E. Easy way to remember when it comes to our junior doctors, the hospitalists, and the interns, and the you know residents, your SHOs or whatever, uh, is dexamethasone, remdesivir, anti-inflammatory medications like such as baricitinib, anticoagulants, um, pulmonary protocols like incentive spirometer, and then E for E for extras like, such as vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc sulfate and so on. So this is a good way. If the patient having any shortness of breath in the hospitalized set setting, you have to give your dexamethasone. That hasn't changed. I will put them on a 10-day course of dexamethasone right away, six milligrams once a day. Remdesivir, yeah, if there's any, uh, you know, mind, be mindful of renal toxicity, but patients hospitalized having re uh, respiratory or any other issues, yes, those severe COVID patients deserve remdesivir, right? Uh, Anti-inflammatory medications such as tocilizumab saved a lot of lives at the beginning of the pandemic. Even nowadays, we use that for immunocompromised patients. Basically, it's an IL-6 inhibitor, 
And then baricitinib we use on regular basis, and these are all CDC, WHO uh, uh, recommended guidelines, uh, 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 protocols. Uh, for very severe patients who are going into ARDS, that kind of scenarios we use the, uh, it's a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, baricitinib. So tocilizumab is IL-6 inhibitor. And then anticoagulants actually sh uh, have been shown to be very effective in COVID-19 related uh, uh, complications, deaths such as COVID, COVID toast, the strokes and the heart attacks and so on and so forth. We use, simply we use uh, low molecular uh, weight heparin uh, and outpatient we use the, uh, you know, uh, the oral anticoagulants. Antibiotics controversial, but we, I still use that, maybe azithromycin, to prevent uh, uh, you know, going into a post-viral uh, uh, bacterial situation. But nowadays, a lot of patients who have had severe COVID-19 infection, they get a lot of gram-negative type of infections, gram-negative, as well as fungal type of infections. And, and a classic example is uh, PCP, or pneumocystis uh, gerovoci, pneumonia, right? That's a fungus. Uh, now we had tons of cases of PCP, we had tons of cases of aspergillus and, and candida non-albicans kind of uh, fungal pneumonias post-COVID, meaning patients who, who, who are on a ventilator with multiple uh, COVID protocols, you know, they are going to get secondary infections. Whatever you do, you can't prevent that. So you need to know those are the ones that we use for, for that kind of patients. So you need to have provide gram-negative coverage. Uh, as well as fungal coverage up front to prevent this. And then you need to have mole rapid molecular tests to diagnose these things. Uh, last but not least, pulmonary protocols, which are incentives parameters, proning, and as well as uh, things like uh, you know, ECMO were used for very, very severe cases uh, uh, you know, of COVID-19. So I would stop at that. I would leave, uh, actually I was supposed to stop it at one o'clock anyway. So uh, I would leave you with this. But thank you so much uh, uh, for, for being here, uh, for listening in on, on the Zoom. Um, but uh, again, um, you can ask me any question, but some of the answers I don't know, because there are some areas that we had no knowledge of as far as COVID infection, COVID-19 viral infections concerned. Uh, but I think we have a handle of that uh, as far as the management is concerned. We, uh, we, I think we do have a, a uh, kind of like a, a clear idea as to what to do in a future pandemic, thanks to COVID-19. Future pandemics, how do you, uh, resp I'm talking about the respiratory diseases, right? If in the unlikely scenario there's another respiratory disease associated pandemic, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons from this uh, pandemic, right? How do I, would I use convalescent plasma right away? Absolutely, I would use convalescent plasma from recovered patients. Would I use monoclonal, uh, I'm sorry, would I use uh, yeah, monoclonal antibodies like ZMAP in Ebola situation. Yeah, that's exactly what we did for COVID-19. But remember, there's another pandemic going on called HIV pandemic that has so far killed 39 million people and it's an ongoing pandemic. So this is a respiratory virus. This is a pulmonary situation mostly, but don't forget the other pandemics going on. We have other, we have other situations that we have to take care of, right? Sadly, HIV, there's no vaccine, but we do have great antivirals, well, thanks to all the scientific work that uh, done so far with HIV. So that's an ongoing pandemic, killing 39 million, and this has killed about 10 to 15 million people. So that's the difference. I always think about HIV pandemic when it comes to COVID-19. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Deepthi, for a very ex for an excellent and very comprehensive talk. I think we'll move on to the next lecture, if that's okay, and then have the questions right at the end. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Ruani Gunawadana. She is the medical director and consultant neurologist at the Center for Brain and Neurocare, um, and uh, affiliate the Johns Hopkins University Hospital, Baltimore, USA. Um, she was a student uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, at North Colombo Medical College, and then due to the problems there, she moved to the St. George's uh, University in, uh, in Grenada from where she graduated. She has completed residencies in internal medicine and neurology, and uh, currently uh, she is uh, affiliate of the Johns Hopkins University Hospital, uh, Baltimore, USA. Over to you, Ruani. Uh, 
the subject of her talk is management of Alzheimer's disease, what's new? I want to thank Dr. Ishan Disoisa for facilitating for me to be here today. SLMA gives me great memories. 30 years ago, I remember sitting, that was my favorite spot there, and taking copious notes. I think every Friday I was here during my third year of medical school. So today we are going to discuss a very important topic, Alzheimer's dementia. Patients are living longer, and we, in the United States, when they looked at how many patients will get Alzheimer's dementia in 2050, there was a 50-fold increase of Alzheimer's dementia. Prevalence is increasing, so we have to do something about it to prevent patients with mild cognitive impairment progressing to Alzheimer's dementia. The latest article I read coming to the USA um, while at the airport was patients with MCI, you could do something to prevent them going to Alzheimer's dementia. 80% will move on, but 30%, there's so many lifestyle changes that you could turn the, the shift to the normal state. So let's talk about key pathology in Alzheimer's dementia. Buildup of amyloid plaque, this is a soluble protein, will form ultimately an amyloid plaque formation. Beta amyloid is a soluble protein, and this buildup of amyloid, I was surprised, can start as early as 45 years of age. We might be asymptomatic, you know, doing all our activities with no problem, but the amyloid plaque can start developing as early as 45. Then there's another key patho pathology finding. The tau protein in the microtubules will form neurofibrillary tangles. And these two, amyloid plaque and the neurofibrillary tangles, can go through so many changes and cause destruction in the nerve cell, neurons, and glial cells, and lead to neurodegeneration. Understanding the risk factors for Alzheimer's dementia, it's not all genetic, we know. Most Alzheimer's dementia patients are sporadic. And there are so many things we could do to change the risk factors. We cannot just get ready at, for example, my age. I'm going to be 61 in April. I can't get ready now to prevent dementia when I'm 80. I have to start a little bit early on, according to the research that we are finding. So early life is low education. We know there is a direct link with more patients who had Alzheimer's dementia there was a lower education uh, association of developing Alzheimer's dementia. What about midlife risk factors? I would um, really address in patients if they have hearing loss, getting a hearing aid is going to be so much beneficial because hearing loss can promote patients going on to Alzheimer's dementia. Traumatic brain injury, excessive alcohol intake, obesity, and I think obesity, the way it's going to cause a risk factor is it causes cerebrovascular disease. And many patients with Alzheimer's dementia, not only did they have amyloid plaques, but they also had vascular uh, ischemic changes in the brain. Looking at, um, so I would like to add in midlife hypercholesterolemia, this is something important. This slide was in 2020 in the Lancet Journal, but since then we have been talking about hypercholesterolemia. We know increased cholesterol causes small vessel cerebrovascular disease, and there is so much research showing that starting patients on statin early on for cerebrovascular disease will prevent dementia. 
So when I have patients that we diagnose, we are in, involved in a trial called IDEAS trial. And the purpose of this trial was to recognize patients early on in the mild cognitive impairment state. And if the spouse or you know, significant others have noticed subtle memory lapses, but these patients are completely functionally normal because they are compensating. And we do this scan called the amyloid scan. And if they have positive amyloid, patients would ask, what can I do to prevent becoming, going into the phase or diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia? And prevention is the most important thing in, at this time. Because we know the amyloid-based medications are still you know, under progress. We are still getting the best treatments. So starting statins early on in the disease, if they have cerebrovascular disease and high cholesterol, and patients might say, my LDL is just 130, or my LDL is just 110. Yes, we need plaque stabilization. We are not treating a level at this time. We are treating plaque stabilization. We are treating microvascular disease. And this is very strongly linked with developing Alzheimer's dementia. Obesity is quite common uh, in the United States. If I have 10 patients that I look at, six or more patients will have overweight due to lack of exercise, eating the wrong diet, and uh, not thinking about greens and grains. And in fact, I was telling my mother yesterday, I need red rice, I'm not going to eat white rice. <laughs> because we need grains, right? Not just carbohydrates. So um, looking at treating obesity is, uh, you know, the diet is important. Uh, you know, making sure patients eat greens and grains and fruits and Mediterranean diet was far more important, and especially saturated fats was more increased with uh, cognitive decline. So plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet, maybe incorporating a little fish in your diet, but not eating saturated fats, and also processed foods. Processed foods will create a, um, an imbalance of the microbiome in your gut. If you are going to eliminate your gut flora, that can create an inflammatory processes that can lead to Alzheimer's dementia. So there's so many things we could do in our midlife to prevent this disastrous journey of Alzheimer's dementia. Not eating processed food, not eating saturated fats, incorporating statins into your uh, medication uh, regimen if you have hypercholesterolemia treating your hypertension, exercising uh, daily. Late life risk factors are smoking, uh, so we encourage patients for smoking cessation. Depression, I think, is a key factor mo mostly seen in the United States than in Sri Lanka, I'm sure. Is depression seen that much? Probably not. It, it is? It is, okay. Um, so serotonin reuptake inhibitors, if we add serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, to their medication, it really helps patients. So if they are not patients with depression and anxiety, if they are not treated, there is good evidence to see that these patients will develop Alzheimer's dementia. Another one that I want to add to this slide is sleep deprivation, lack of sleep. So it sounds like the doctors, right? I usually sleep five, five and a half hours. Sometimes I might be lucky to get six because there's a lot of electronic medical records that I have to complete before I go to sleep. Plus I am you know, kind of addicted to exercise. I exercise in the morning and hour, evening and hour. Then in between I have a big clinic and then finish all my notes before I sleep. But the prime, uh, the adequate amount of sleep is six hours because sleep deprivation is now associated with Alzheimer's dementia. Time we sleep is when we clear those buildup of toxic agents that can lead to dementia. And also, what about too much sleep? Do you think too much sleep is bad for you? It is. So there is now a sweet spot for your sleep. Less than six hours is not good. 
and more than 10 hours is not good. I think more than 10 hours is they're probably thinking these people who sleep a lot, they are like lackadaisic, they are not doing any much physical activity. What about um, uh, air pollution and diabetes? So diabetes is uh, pretty much you know, rising because of um, ex not having exercise, weight gain, and diabetes leads to cerebrovascular disease. And when you look at patients with Alzheimer's dementia, glucose metabolism, insulin resistance, many patients are now linked with Alzheimer's dementia with diabetes. Now looking at the current landscape of medications, I, was, I remember when I was a resident, 1996, using Aricept when it first came to the market, choline esterase inhibitors, FDA approved for mild, moderate, severe dementia, and I, it's worldwide use. But these are symptomatic treatment. The others are rivastigmine. And I like the rivastigmine over Aricept because there's the patch. Because Aricept, most of the time, patients will have diarrhea and abdominal pain, nausea. But if I use the rivastigmine patch, it's also called Exelon, that when you use the patch, the nausea, the GI symptoms are evaded. So there's a plus using the patch. Uh, galantamine, not very popular, but it's approved again uh, for mild to moderate dementia. It's a choline esterase inhibitor. Mementine, quite popular. It works on the glutamate pathway. It's approved for moderate to severe dementia. And then in 2014, they repackaged, added the Aricept to Namenda, fixed dose for moderate to severe dementia. But you see from 1996 until 2021, there was nothing for, as a disease-modifying therapy. Most trials failed to show a good outcome, especially to improve cognition. Then 2021 came aducanumab. It was very controversial, the approval process, it was a rapid approval. And, uh, but there were some good benefits from one part of the study that we will go on to. And there are two other drugs coming up at the end of the year, donanimab and lacanimab. So you see aducanumab, all these MABs are monoclonal antibody. And as the doctor told before, lots of monoclonal antibody is now being used for migraine and Alzheimer's dementia and many other treatments, um, even myasthenia gravis and uh, polyneuropathy. Now let's talk about this ATN framework. It is now defined as Alzheimer's disease is now defined as a biological construct. Looking at amylite, tau protein, and neuronal injury. So this framework, the ATN framework, will be a nice tool for you when you see patients at your clinic. We'll say you have a patient who is probably like 55 years old and has memory problems. And you need to know, is this really dementia or is this something else? And so biological markers uh, have progressed over the last decade so that we can diagnose patients way early on in this disease process. So you see uh, the CSF amyloid, you could uh, measure your patient's CSF amyloid, which is a very accurate um, marker. Then what amyloid PET scan, which we have in the United States, it's still used only in certain research centers, and we have participated in a trial called the IDEAS trial to recognize patients in the mild cognitive impairment state. So amyloid PET has given us so many surprises in patients who we really didn't think they had Alzheimer's disease pathology, and they do. Tau protein, tau pet, is also another uh, biomarker tool that you can diagnose your patient in the CSF as well as um, 
screen, uh, the PET scan. And what about neurodegeneration? As the disease progresses, the brain starts shrinking, so you can do the anatomic MRI. Is there any atrophy of the hippocampus, the mesial temporal lobe? You can do FDG PET scans, looking um, at the glucose metabolism. If the patient has Alzheimer's dementia, there is, there'll be hypometabolism in certain parts of the brain, and looking also at CSF tau protein. So the ATN network, currently is one of the framework that they are using as a tool to diagnose patients and also looking at the research level for therapeutic uh, trials. Now looking at Alzheimer's dementia, as I told you, it does not develop overnight. It develops over years. So 20 years prior to developing your first cognitive you know, dysfunction and functional impairment 20 years prior is the process going to start, the amyloid deposition. Uh, initially, um, uh, patients, you know, have uh, after amyloid deposition, that they believe the first deposition is the amyloid protein. And after that, after several years goes by, it's a tau protein that gets deposited in the mesial temporal lobe. Then it spreads to the cortex and patients will have subtle memory issues. But they're still believed to be asymptomatic. Then goes on to the mild cognitive impairment. Patients are forgetful, very subtle, but it's progressive. That's the key thing. But they're functionally not impaired. They can do all their activities. They can compensate well. When the sp uh, spouses bring the patient, they say, nothing wrong with me, but my wife wanted me to come. Most of the time, that's what we hear. Patients are not happy coming to the office because the spouse will say, he can't fix this anymore. He used to fix everything so well, and now he's struggling. He's taking a little longer to fix. But these are subtle problems that, you know, the sp oh, he's getting a little lost when he drives. But then after when you get Alzheimer's dementia, not only the cognitive dysfunction, they also have functional impairment. And that's, you know, when that time comes, you know, I think the game is over because there's so much plaque. And how are you going to remove this plaque without bleeding and amyloid-related uh, edema? Now, what do we know about APOE4 and Alzheimer's risk factors? So if you inherit one gene from your parent, you have a four-time risk of having amyloid in the brain. And if you inherit both from both parents, your risk is tenfold. And this is a rare form of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is the autosomal dominant variant. And you see the amyloid deposition in the brain is dose dependent. If you have one gene, not much amyloid. If you have both genes, you have so much amyloid in the brain. So we, this is a risk factor that we have noticed. And APOE antigen, E4, is an important uh, gene abnormality to know, especially when we give these newer agents that are targeting amyloid patients who have bleeding in the brain are mostly the patients who have APOE4 antigen. Now looking at the neuropathology, so when we have patients, when we put patients on the IDEAS trial, um, we have patients that come with positive amyloid scan. And then we have a question here to do. What does the doctor think the primary pathophysiology for this patient's dementia? So we click Alzheimer's dementia because the patient had amyloid plaque. Then they ask, what is the secondary cause? Then we look at the MRI scan, and if we see any vascular chronic small vessel ischemia, we will add vascular. Then if he sometimes we might have this patient you know, we might think could be Lewy body too because patient also has this, you know, visual hallucinations. So this was quite a surprise looking at the neuropathology of patients with mild cognitive impairment. Only 20% of patients had just amyloid. Majority of patients had mixed 
Co-pathologies. What were those? So in the past, we had just isolated one pick diagnosis, amyloid, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, you know, vascular, but not this mixed pathologies, what's going on in your one patient's brain. I remember I saw a patient probably like 10 years ago. I really knew this patient had Alzheimer's dementia, but the patient also walked like a Parkinson patient. So is it Parkinson dementia? I have to like, in my tech, I had to just pick one. But I was still confused. I knew there was something going on in the alpha synucleinopathy. That means the synuclein pathway where the Parkinson Lewy body pathology. So this is what they found in this patient that we truly believed had Alzheimer's dementia or MCI due to Alzheimer's type they had mixed pathologies. These patients had Lewy body pathology, alpha synucleinopathy, 20% had Alzheimer's amyloid plaque, majority of patients also had vascular etiologies, then TDP43 was seen, proteinopathies, and tyopathies. So what the message, the message we are going to take home is when we see a patient with Alzheimer's dementia, this patient may have mixed pathologies. Now, other antimortem biomarkers, looking at tau PET scan, is helpful because that shows neuronal injury and advanced Alzheimer's dementia. The FTG PET scan showing the reduction of glucose metabolism in various, so we, if you have a patient with, we'll say, behavioral abnormalities, sometimes we have patient, memory problem is not the big thing, but such aggressive behavior and voracious eating, that sounds like frontal lobe dementia. And, um, it's a problem because this patient who was really doing well suddenly in their 50s is having impulsive behavior disorder and patient is also having um, eating disorder. So eating, excessive eating and excessive impulsive disinhibition behavior with subtle memory problem, frontal lobe dementia. And if we think of these dementias, it's nice when we see the, front, the FDG scan, reduction of glucose metabolism in the frontal lobe will go more with the diagnosis of fr um, frontal lobe dementia. Now again, showing, um, looking at the biomarkers, because when we are talking about dementia nowadays, before it was the post-mortem diagnosis to confirm, but now it's going to be coming in the next 10 years, is going to be your biological markers. You might even start, start uh, checking the serum because when they looked at the continuum of this process, the first to be positive is your biomarkers in the bloodstream, your amyloid and the tau protein. And then as the disease progresses, CSF biomarkers were positive, amyloid in the CSF and the tau protein. And after further development of the disease and progression of the disease, PET scans were positive for amyloid and tau protein. And when there was neurodegeneration continuing and atrophy of the brain, uh, brain then fr uh, structural imaging will show reduction of brain volume in the hippocampus, cingulate gyrus, and other areas. Now, when is it appropriate to you know, do myo biomarkers for your patient? And I had a patient, a 50-year-old patient, who presented um, to me during the pandemic. The wife stated, my husband has an, she said, acute change. I think he has memory problems, he's not talking as much, and my, Upon questioning, 
I asked, was there any recent catastrophic events? Because it was an acute presentation. So his mother passed away from COVID. He went to see his mother. Uh, she was still laying down on the, f she d he did not hear from the mother for two weeks. So he went to see the mother. She was laying down in her home, mutilated, two weeks dead. So that obviously I thought was a shock to this patient. He was the only child. And my diagnosis was, I think he has depression and he has pseudo-dementia. I think that's why he's not talking much. But one of the things that I do in my exam is, yes, I know depression and all this, but I did a Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. And this test, patient really had problems naming the three animals. We had three animals in the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, the rhinoceros, the hippopotamus, and the camel. Patient could not name any of these animals. I got the patient to draw a simple cube. Could not draw the cube. What about drawing a clock, putting all the numbers, and marking the time as 11.15? That was a struggle. Month and the date was no problem. So I was thinking if he's depressed, he should still be able to do these items. So I was wondering, he looks like he has some aphasia because he's unable to. Like if I, uh, I had a cup of coffee that I was sipping and I asked, what is this? And he said, oh, it's the brown liquid you drink in the morning. Whoa, he couldn't say coffee. So I sent him to University of Maryland for neuropsychology testing, and she also confirmed that she had a aphasia. And patient had primary progressive aphasia, which is a form of Alzheimer's dementia that young patients can get. He had an ApoE4 antigen positive, uh, amyloid scan, so the biomarker was this time helpful. We did not do the CSF, we did the PET scan, amyloid, he had l a plot of amyloid in the Broca's area, in the frontal area and the associated area. So he's now, so the, this ATN net framework was helpful for my patient, for me to diagnose this patient early on in the disease. Now he's at Johns Hopkins trying to, you know, look at other treatment options to prevent the progression of the disease. Now looking at um, tau, and phosphorylated tau is becoming very popular. They are looking at these markers as um, looking at with advanced disease, looking in the serum and the CSF. Looking at amyloid um, and tau proteins, these are not only produced in the brain, but produced by many other organs. So the reduction of the ratio an increased P tau, reduction of the beta 42 slash beta 40 ratio, and increased ratio of phosphorylated tau is a significant finding in patients with Alzheimer's disease pathology. Now what about other biomarkers? We know that amyloid and tau is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease pathology. But what we have learned so far is these are not the only two pathologies. There are many more co-pathologies that is seen in Alzheimer's dementia. So just going down the amyloid route may be not the way to treat our patient. In Alzheimer's dementia, we know there is inflammation in the glial cells that takes place. And looking at a marker of GFAP, glial fibrillary acetic protein biomarker, has been increased in patients with Alzheimer's dementia. What about another very important co-pathology, the alpha selenicleinopathies like patients with Lewy body, so 40% of patients with Alzheimer's dementia also had SNAP-25 markers. That means they had the Lewy body markers, which was seen in Parkinson disease, synuclear protein abnormalities, 
So that's why when we see our Alzheimer's dementia patients, they also have gait disturbance. They're walking, they're balanced. So 40, I was surprised to see that number as high as 40% of patients had problems with um, a marker that was seen in Lewy body dementia. The other important markers, you know, tau protein, vascular dementia, vascular, um, you know, uh, pathologies, this is just not atherosclerosis, but there are vascular uh, processes that goes on that will lead to dementia, and they're working on other biomarkers such as VCAM1. I think I'm good, right? Oh, no. Sorry about that. So looking at the anti-amyloid therapies, I know everybody was waiting to hear about what is the latest treatment now for Alzheimer's dementia. Um, what's approved in the United States so far is the aducanumab. This approval was very controversial because of the accelerated program, because the benefit was very marginal of this trial. So all these therapies, um, aducanumab, donanimab, lecanimab, gantaramab, all these are monoclonal antibodies. They will attack or work on different areas of the cascade of the amyloid plaque journey. So aducanumab, so if, as I mentioned, the monomer um, amyloid protein sticks together and makes a monomer and monomer becomes an oligomer. Oligomer makes a tertiary structure called the protofibrils, then A beta fibril goes on to the plaque formation, which destroys your neuron. The adecanumab and the gantamab works on the oligomer side. That's what we believe. These are not you know, hard and fast rules. Donanimab, which is going to be approved at the end of the year, works on the um, a beta fibril location, and lecanemab also is going to be approved at the end of the year. It works on the uh, uh, protofibril to fibril level. And when you look at the pivotal studies, the donanimab, the trailblazer 2 and trailblazer 3, the trailblazer 2 study enrolled patients with early Alzheimer's disease, but they needed to meet the criteria by having a positive amyloid PET scan. The Trailblazer 3 study had cognitively normal patient who had high risk for Alzheimer's dementia based on elevated phosphorylated tau level. Lacanimab, Clarity AD study had early asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease patients, and the study called AHEAD 345 had normal cognition with elevated brain beta amyloid. And gantaramab had prodromal or mild amyloid. So if you look at these studies, they are trying to, you know, trying to diagnose these patients even in the asymptomatic stage. And the question is, how low can we go? How are our patients going to accept in the asymptomatic stage saying, guess what, you have beta amyloid and you're going to have high risk to develop Alzheimer's dementia. Looking at the three trials, uh, the eMERGE trial is the one, the aducanumab that got approved. There was a high dose and a low dose and the placebo but there was only a 23% reduction of the, uh, so reduction in cognitive decline was only 23%. And it was only seen in one of the trials, the eMERGE trial, and not the other trials that this medication was looked at. 
The trailblazer study looked at a change in the sentinoids. There was a reduction in cognitive decline, 3.2 improvement in the scores, cognitive scores. And the other medication that's coming at the end of the year, lecanemab, there was a reduction in brain amyloid, 70 units. So looking at all this data, we see reduction of the amyloid, but there was not much reduction of the cognitive performance. So that was the reason. Um, so it was really targeted with the amyloid and the P-tau proteins when there was one patient who uh, died, an uh, 84-year-old patient in the aducanumab stud trial, passed away at age uh, 84. Patient was given, uh, was in the placebo arm, but when her dementia was, became moderate to severe, she was moved to the treatment arm. Patient got 32 doses of aducanumab, and what they found was this patient who received 32 doses, her brain MRI had very less amyloid and tau protein. So we know these drugs are targeting to reduce the tau protein. There was not much reduction in the cognitive performance. Now what about using these amyloid-targeted therapies? The amyloid-related imaging abnormalities called ARIA. ARIA is seen in 10 to 31 percent of patients treated by this uh, antibody. And edema can most of the time, they're asymptomatic, but when they're symptomatic, they can have headache, blurred vision, stroke-like symptoms, and other neurologic deficits. And aria can be just edema or microhemorrhages. When they looked at these patients who had microhemorrhages and aria, edema, these were patients who had ApoE4 antibody positive. So again, going back to our ATN framework, if we knew our patients had ApoE4 antibody, maybe patient would have got a lower dose. Then the next question is, is the lower dose going to be effective? So um, looking at the targets of Alzheimer's disease, we know just going behind amyloid and tau protein may not be the answer for our patients. And there is, in the um, cascade of drugs that's coming up in the future, they are looking at drugs, looking at anti-tau drugs are in phase one trial, uh, synaptic plasticity and neuroprotection, receptor agonist and receptor antagonist, inflammation, infection. They, you know, my patient, um, the 50-year-old man who has Alzheimer's dementia, the primary progressive aphasia, they really believe in integrative medicine. So they went to the doctor to look at infection as a prodromal cause for his Alzheimer's dementia, and he's going through antibiotic treatment for his Alzheimer's dementia. So he, they're planning to do the Western medicine, you know, antibody treatment, but it was disappointing. They are now trying the infectious round integrative medicine. They are also taking some Eastern, you know, herbs, uh, turmeric. So they are trying to do a nice cocktail. Wife is doing a lot of research and maximizing the husband's reducing progression. There is also metabolism and bioengineering novel. There are many therapy uh, treatment options ongoing. Uh, f for to treat this devastating disease. So it's important for us to diagnose these patients at mild cognitive impairment state to prevent these patients going into Alzheimer's dementia. Using biomarkers in the future will be a novel tool for you to diagnose these patients early on in the disease. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Presentation. Um, can we first have questions on the COVID lecture? Any questions? Uh, Akil, anything on the chat? Any, any questions on the chat? Nothing. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Yes. There's, there's been a lot of talk about vaccine harm. 
And uh, there's several parliaments around the world that are actually talking about this and debating it. And they're looking at various aspects of, of this in terms of what Pfizer has done or not done, um, how the contracts have been procured, um, the lack of, um, let's say, re uh, harm reporting, in other words, adverse events reporting. And there's been um, very little published by the government um, in terms of this. Um, and I think also there's been a significant amount of censorship, um, at least in Europe. I can't comment on the US. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that? And do you think it's valid? And do you think we should be giving our mRNA vaccines? <laughs> vaccine harm. Huh? Yeah, vaccine harm is, is, is a concern, definitely, yeah. Oh, thanks for that question. Actually, I kind of expected that every time I give a lecture uh, on uh, vac uh, COVID vaccines, there's, this particular question comes up. Uh, like any other uh, pharmaceutical agent, whether it's a vaccine or a drug, there are side effects with, with these vaccines. Like, uh, right now, we, the reporting system is so strong that we do have access to uh, the, the database of all those uh, 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 side effects and the complications and stuff. The classic one is, uh, you know, some of the mRNA vaccines causing uh, myocarditis and pericarditis, right? And there was also a concern about bivalent vaccine, which is the latest uh, uh, COVID vaccine causing strokes over 65 years. Again, so so those concerns are there. But my uh, short answer to those people. You have blood pressure, high blood pressure, you take a blood pressure medication, right? Are there no side effects with any of those medications? Yeah, definitely. There are side effects that you deal with, that you are aware of, that you are mindful of, and that you will probably have to uh, uh, kind of deal with the side effects when that happens. So it's the same scenario with uh, the COVID vaccines, as far as I'm concerned. The need for COVID vaccine is there will we'll continue as we as we discuss you know on multiple slides the need for covid vaccines the boosters i'm talking about will be there for certain people such as over, uh, elderly patients people with chronic medical problems like chronic kidney disease chf lung disease and so on hiv transplant and then uh, the need for covid for immunocompromised patients for, for, right so so those are the patients that i would those are the kind of people i would target for boosters. For the rest of us, again, it's the same question, to be or not to be, as uh, Shakespeare pointed out, right? It's to be boosted or not to be boosted. So it is your individual risk. You decide whether to be boosted or not. And when you're boosted, when you get those vaccines, yeah, you need to be aware of those side effects. I'll give you another example. The, the, the majority of those myocarditis and pericarditis have been reported in a younger, in young uh, males. Athletes, yeah. Right? So again, so those, that category, people have to be aware of it. Why would I give a booster after booster after booster to a young, healthy adult male? Mm. That's a question that you should raise. So everything, just like any other situation, have become very, very common sense based now. If I, uh, I don't know whether I answered your question. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I mean, I think it's controversial. It is topic. absolutely controversial, but again, pandemic itself, I discussed many, many controversies uh, with regard to this pandemic, right? Starting from the masks, starting um, uh, with uh, the vaccines, the med certain medications like remdesivir, right? And then the, 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 the isolation and uh, lockdown mandates, right? Mandates, so the government's mandated certain areas to be locked down which is controversial. So I think vaccine situation is also one of those. Would there, uh, like with uh, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines, we had major issues, right, with blood clotting. And that was pointed out right away. So uh, the reporting system was very clear on that. Um, but when it, when it regards to mRNA vaccines, it's not so. mRNA is supposed to be a very safe, you know, very safe tool to use to prevent uh, Ex, um, you know, catastrophic uh, COVID infections. But, uh, um, in terms of the AstraZeneca one, um, yeah. I think I think despite the uh, side effects which were being recorded or let's say observed at least, yeah, um, the drive to vaccinate continued. Um, that's what I observed. Um, yeah. In terms of the 
mRNA, um, I think uh, um, there have been several issues where the reporting system in Europe has been suppressed yeah. and may be misrepresented. Again, uh, uh, that itself is controversial. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the whole thing about this COVID has become poli uh, politicized now, right? That's the sad truth about COVID. That's what I tried to point out in, in my earlier slides that, uh, you know, COVID came about three years ago, right? At that time, everybody was so, they were freaking out pretty much, right? Uh, you can't find, you couldn't find anybody on the streets and stuff. They, remember those days, right? And then little by little, they, uh, they came out, with the scientists, since it was always that tussle between the scientists versus uh, people in general, and, and then the virus was tied in, kind of mutating into different different forms to to evade those situations. So the scientists came up with the vaccine, scientists came up with the antiviral, scientists came up with uh, monoclonal antibodies, right? Uh, so, so every step of the way, I think the scientists did their part to, to mitigate this pandemic. I believe that this is the end of the pandemic, but the infections will go on. So there's going to be some controversies whether, whether you like it or not, right? Uh, so it is what it is. We got to move on with life. And, and uh, as you know, uh, people started traveling. Now I'm here in, the, in, in Sri Lanka, my motherland, after three years. A classic example, right? We got to move on. So every individual has to assess their risk factors before we decide, before they decide on vaccinating more and more, right? uh, or boosting more and more. Once the year boosters have been proposed now, for, for that category of people, and that's okay. That's the way to go. Would I take it? Probably not, right? That's, that's how I would look at it. it uh, it's a very, very individual. At the same time, it's all politicized too. Thank you. Purali. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk on uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you know that uh, the Sri Lankan government uh, has reduced the retirement age, so promoting early retirement, right? So we see that uh, it is not a joke, right? We see that uh, there are studies which have proved that early retirement lead to cognitive decline. and. Uh, uh, enhancement of Alzheimer's disease prevalence. So how do you see that? I, to identify myself, I am Dr. Murali Valipranathan, consultant community physician from the Ministry of Health. Uh, and also I would like to know now the chess and there are several other uh, interventions are proposed to prevent the progress of the Alzheimer's disease. So what is your thoughts on that line? Thank you. Sure. So early retirement doesn't sound good at all, right? Because we have seen patients who are extremely active, like doctors, you know, or other professions, and suddenly, be, you know, stay home and become sedentary. Because when you are a very busy physician, what I have noticed is only very few people have other hobbies. Right? Because you're very busy with your profession, you have your private practice, then you come home, you're dead tired, you go to sleep, you wake up, but there's nothing, no other hobbies being built up in your life. Mm -hmm. So you retire and then you stay home, and uh, social isolation and you know has uh, you know s definitely precipitates cognitive decline. So maybe you have to voice to the government and say, we are not going to retire, if, right? That's ridiculous. I'm thinking I sh I'll be working until I'm a good 80s because I enjoy my work. I enjoy my exercise, I enjoy my work. And I have to work for two girls going into med school. <laughs> I want to pay their loan, so I will be working. And something that I enjoy working, I think it's, it's I tell them it's like eating ice cream, working, seeing my neurology patients, trying to figure out what do they have. And, and you know, communication is really important for this, you know, being a neurologist, talking to the patient, getting a good history. What, what is the most, um, what is your most disabling symptom you're here today? 
you know, it's all about the history, the neurology diagnosis. So looking at the risk factor modification, I think that's the most important thing that we could do until these expensive biomarkers, the fancy tests are going to come. Um, so looking at hypertension, you know, getting the patients to have a blood pressure diary. And when they come to the doctor, if the blood pressure is increased, uh, treating hypertension uh, is really important. I usually dry, draw a vascular, I, I draw like a big tree for these patients and I show them the bottom of the tree branches. The roots is, you know, the, how we, you can have peripheral arterial disease, even with diabetes. Uh, peripheral artery disease, heart disease, kidney disease, the top branches are the uh, cerebrovascular branches, and it is a disease that has atherosclerosis, which is diffuse. And I tell them, diabetes is just sugar is for the lay person just to diagnose. But inside your body, every minute, there is progressive atherosclerosis, narrowing of your blood vessels, causing silent strokes, silent heart attacks, ischemia to the kidneys and peripheral arterial disease, and how important if they have you know, statins to uh, remodel the blood vessels. I really promote statins because statins patients, if a doctor says, take your cholesterol medication, what are the patients going to say? I don't need it. It's not that elevated. And, but if I, you draw a nice picture and show you know, blockages everywhere and plaque stabilization, opening up your blood vessels, preventing dementia, just a little bit of education, what this cholesterol medication is going to do to you, I think it's going to be very beneficial. I take a statin. You know, I don't have hypertension. I have a little high cholesterol, tad bit. But I'm taking, really getting ready for when I'm 80, I do not, when you are 80, 80 plus, one in three can have dementia, cognitive problems. When you're 65, one in 10. So the incidence is rising. And uh, so you have to you know, get ready and vascular cause is looking like a big etiology now for dementia. So looking at patients with um, exercise, and I think uh, we have to put uh, the, uh, this concept to our patients that exercise is important. I tell patients, if I can exercise twice a day, morning I go to for my class, evening I go to my Now I incorporated my husband in the class. It's mostly women, but he comes. And um, it's really good because this is an extensive exercise called, called the PO bar. It's toning, strengthening, and lifting. And this, you know, in the morning, you wake up in the morning, one hour before your work and you exercise, it gives you a good mood. You have, you know, good cardiovascular exercise and then it really helps and you, it's like, I tell patients, it's like brushing your teeth every morning. You have to incorporate your daily regimen exercise, not just say, I walk twice a week on a Saturday and a Sunday. It doesn't work. So exercise is really important for us to have it in our routine of you know, and then eating healthy food and eating home-cooked food is really important, encouraging patients to have a little, you know, vegetable, you know, pot in the house and, you know, growing their own vegetables or buying produce, uh, fresh produce and making your own food and looking at greens and grains are really important and not eating processed food. So there's so many lifestyle changes if there are, you know you if there are patients who have depression to, encouraging them to be on a ssri not only going to the gym and exercising and going to work not i think working at home really uh, social isolation also precipitated a lot of psychiatric problems in young patients and uh, you know cognitive decline in older patients so there is so many things we could do that's a great question to prevention of modifying the risk factors. Any more questions? In the absence of more questions, I would like to thank the two speakers, Professor Deepthi and Dr. Ruani, who also happen to be my good friends. Thank you very much.